Hello, my name is Richard Crumdeek. I'm a member of the board of the Music at St. Albans Music Series. Uh, today marks the beginning of the 2011-2012 season and it features a concert of Baroque concertos by composers such as Corelli, Vivaldi, Muffat, and Bach. I'm joined today by two members of the orchestra, David Wilson, a violinist who studied at Indiana University and is now a resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, and Geza Cordes, who's also a violinist, also studied at Indiana University, and is a professor of music at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I want to begin with Geza. Geza, this uh, concert is going to be played on period instruments. Um, can you tell us what the characteristics of these period string instruments are and how they differ from those seen in a modern orchestra? Sure. Um, actually, they don't differ that much, but the little differences that they are make a big difference in how you play. Um, around in the early 19th century, instruments were what we call modernized. So when you see a, a violin in a symphony orchestra, it's probably an old instrument, but it was messed with because the aesthetics changed. And what people were after was a stronger, brighter, more projecting sound. And in order to get that, well, let me show you this. You see the neck of the instrument, and you see the line between the fingerboard and the neck here. It's exactly parallel to the top of the instrument. It's flush with it. And in order to make an instrument like this louder, what you do is you tilt the neck back a little bit, which means you get a higher bridge, which means you have more tension on the strings, which makes for a brighter and more projecting sound. Um, the bigger difference, though, otherwise the instruments are unchanged, the bigger difference is the bow that we're using. Um, this is a replica of an, an early 18th or late 17th century bow. And as you can see, unlike a modern bow, this one is curved outward. Uh, it has a tip that's pointed. It has no metal at the frog. And because of all those little changes, and it's also shorter, um, the weight distribution of the bow is very different and it has a completely different range of articulations from a modern bow. Now by using this equipment, we're trying to get closer to what the composers knew at the time when they wrote the pieces. And it makes us approach the music differently because it re requires different playing techniques. This leads me to my next question and that is you're not only playing on period instruments but you're playing in a historically informed manner. So my question to David is, how is the performance of this music, uh, how is your approach to this music different from what we might hear with a modern day orchestra? Well, when you hear us play today, you'll hear a lot of attention to details like the articulation of the notes and the shape of the individual notes. Uh, we also pay attention to the, the large, larger shapes of the phrase, but we tend to focus on smaller, a smaller level of detail than a modern instrument group might. And the sound of the instruments itself makes a very different sound than you might hear if the music was being played on modern instruments. What about, and a question for Gaze, what about your approach to ornamentation and how it differs from the modern orchestra? Well, in a modern orchestra, you play what's on the page. It's required. In chamber music, you might stick a trill in or two. Um, in some of the music we're going to play, there's going to be a lot of ornamentation. I would, link, I would liken it to jazz, if anything, because we use what we see on the page as a point of departure and then we add to it, which was something that people were very fond of in the 17th and 18th century. Um, this uh, concert is going to feature many concertos, and when many of us think about concertos, we think about the concertos of Mozart and Beethoven and Chopin, where we have a solo instrument accompanied by a large orchestra. But some of these pieces are not immediately recognizable to the audience as concertos. So what is the difference between a Baroque concerto and those of later eras? Nowadays, terms like concertos mean something very specific. And in the past, the terms were interchangeable with other terms. For example, in the early Baroque, concerto and sonata were very much interchangeable. An early definition of concerto meant a piece in which many different instruments and voices all sing together in concert together. Mm -hmm. uh, by the late 17th century, there are some very interesting definitions of concertos 
uh, defined as the contrast between a big group and a small group. So you could have maybe a small group of three, two violins, and a cello with its own, its own continual chording section, and then the bigger group of, of more, uh, several, several violins on each part, and, and so on, like an orchestra and a small chamber group. Uh, or you could have four, four or more soloists and a big group, or you could have two soloists, Nowadays, we think of a concerto as one solo instrument plus a big orchestra, which was also an option, although in the Baroque it was a less common option. You're also playing music by some um, Baroque composers that are not as well known to many audience members. One of them is Heinrich Bieber. And what can you tell us, uh, Geza, about this composer and the piece that you're playing? Um, Bieber was a composer who lived primarily in Salzburg, so he's from a southern German slash Austrian slash almost bohemian background. And he was renowned for his improvisations, for one thing. He was also renowned for furthering violin technique. So um, a lot of the pieces he wrote are very virtuosic, uh, make use of different tunings. We won't play a piece like that today, we'll play something for standard tuning but he knew how to make use of the instruments at their best and use their different colors and he was very fond of many violas in his pieces and that's what we're going to do so i'll be switching back and forth for example today and another composer is georg mufat and i understand david that you have some expertise uh, in the music of mufat can you tell us a little bit about that composer mufat lived at a time when each part of Europe had its own distinct style of music and it was a little before the time when people from one country tried to write music in the style of another country but Mufa was ahead of the curve in that sense and he came by it naturally uh, his grandparents had immigrated from Scotland he grew up in Alsace where they speak German and French he studied as a young man in Paris and uh, lived mostly after that in German-speaking countries. So Mufat tried to combine the best qualities of Italian, German, and French music, something unheard of at that time, uh, take all those best qualities and put it into one music. And in fact, he made a great metaphor uh, that if we can combine the musical styles of all these countries, then maybe there's actually hope that people from different countries can get along too. At, that, at the time when Mufat lived, there were wars going on all the time, and eventually they caught up with him at, in about 1701. But uh, he, was, he was very much interested in music as a, a way of human expression, not just from one country. Well, I would agree with Mufat that, um, that um, music certainly brings people together in a, in a very unique way. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, visit with me today, and we are certainly looking forward to your concert later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.